This is a two-camera room. Two-camera room. Change the order of the slide. Change the order. I only have four slides. I decided to do it. Then I'm changing it to a slide. Definition class. T-minus 30 seconds. All those four slides. Let's see if I can read it. Yeah, I know. I know. I said I have my whole pages of notes. Just ask lots of questions. Yeah, exactly. There we go. So now we're actually getting a big enough audience for an actual discussion. Okay. That's right. You got to have faith for that last, you know, 45 seconds. But you're there. Welcome. I think we are going to get started. The clock says it's uh, 2.30. I want to welcome you to a, a panel discussion on um, audiovisual multimedia instructional technology. Um, this panel actually is an outgrowth of a discussion on the Technoids list in January. Um, there was a fair amount of discussion about um, where does the traditional AV department sit within um, the law school. So um, I've actually assembled a panel of three different viewpoints. Um, from uh, to represent the different kind of different um, aspects of where that um, might sit. This is going to be a very informal panel. Um, we want you to jump in at any time with questions for any of our panelists. Um, even though there there is kind of a sequence to it, it is meant to be kind of a discussion. We'd have all preferred to have been in lounge chairs, you know, up in the front, you know, drinking coffee, kind of like the view, right? Um, and, and really having a conversation with the audience and having the audience participate a great deal with what they think. Because as, as many of these types of panel discussions are, there's, there's nothing right and wrong. It's kind of a sharing of experiences. Um, just to uh, cover the speakers, I'll go into bios in a little bit. But uh, Glenn Peter Ollers directly to my left. Uh, Terry, myself, Jean Danlenko, Terry McCormick um, in the middle, and then Kay McDonnell at the very end. Um, I am the Educational Technology Specialist at the University of Minnesota, um, where I took over what was considered to be the traditional AV department and then also do um, technology training and actually transform the department into an educational technology group then um, in order to encompass kind of what, what more modern thinking is for um, multimedia and instructional tech. I'm going to disconnect here for a moment. There we go. Um, where I'm going to introduce now, sorry, I needed to look at my bio notes. I apologize. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Peter Allers is, is most proud of the fact that he's a father of six, but more to the point. Um, he is the um, Associate Dean of Information Services at the Berry University's Duane O. Andreas School of Law in Orlando. Now, this is definitely no Mickey Mouse organization. Um, uh, um, 
Before coming to Orlando last year, he spent 10 years in the Ozarks um, at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Um, Kay McDonald is the director of Information Technology Services at the University of Pennsylvania. She has been the director um, since 2001, the acting director since 2000, and spent an additional 10 years there um, as a systems uh, and network manager. She has a master's in education from the University of Pennsylvania and an uh, undergraduate degree from Wharton. Uh, Terry McCormick is the head of the M. Robert Corrin Center for Clinical Legal Education in the Charles B. Sears Law Library. All of these names. Um, he is at the University of Buffalo. <laughs> he, and he has worked in his current job uh, since 1986. And bear with me one moment when I switch back to the two slides that I have. Um, we do have a little bit of structure to our discussion, um, just to kind of help out facilitate, uh, to facilitate it. Each of the panelists are going to be covering or, or talking about each of these points at some point. Um, the history of how AB got to where it is at their organization, um, a snapshot of their organization, including how it's actually organized, um, a list of their services, what it is that they actually do, what, they cons what do they consider AB, um, how the organization actually works with whatever is considered central there, central university, central media services, whatever, and then kind of a broader issue of um, how, do the people in the field actually need to understand teaching? Do they actually need to be more like an instructional technologist like, uh, like it was discussed yesterday in one of the sessions? Or is it really a technologist job as opposed to having some aspect with, with teaching? Um, once again, questions are encouraged at all time. I'm going to start off the discussion, and you can all um, – and jump in at any time here with what we decided would be kind of some working definitions of AV or audiovisual. Once again, this is just a kind of lead into the discussion. Um, we kind of brainstormed and, and, and thought that it would be a, a specific set of information technologies which combines computer technology and the technologies used to capture um, and transmit video and audio. Um, and that it was the intersection of those types of technologies that are used in teaching and research, specifically within law schools here. Um, and then kind of as another point, it's, it's the boundary between the classroom, the library, and the IT organization. So it's this big, gray, fuzzy mass. And that's kind of this big, gray, fuzzy mass that we're going to be dealing with over the next you know, 50 minutes or so. Um, any questions, comments? Anyone disagree with what we think AV is? Does the panelists, do the panelists have anything to add before I turn it over to them? No, it's fuzzy enough. Is it fuzzy enough? Are we all thoroughly fuzzied? All right, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Glenn Peter Allers to talk a little bit about Barry. Um, I think they asked me to start since I had less to say. I'm not sure. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is that two years ago I spoke at Cali. And the question was, where do you put IT in the law school? And I felt very strongly then and still feel strongly today that it belongs under the library. I've come a little bit, uh, I've turned a little bit um, since that talk two years ago in that I, I, I believe the term librarian is evolving, so I'm not sure I could say it belongs in the library because I'm not sure I could define library any longer. But from a manager's point of view, from the dean's point of view, from the faculty's point of view, I do feel that I would rather point to one person and say, you take care of that stuff. Um, I don't care if you call it AV. I don't care if you call it educational technology. I don't care if you call it information resources. I'm not sure what you call it, but take care of that for me. I don't want to go to five different people. And so philosophically, I still feel that way. I think there are new skills coming on in law schools. I think that many people have to learn. It's not just for some one person or some few people to learn them. Uh, Barry is an almost standalone university. We do have Barry University is in Miami Shores, about 250 miles north in Orlando is the law school. Uh, we pretty much handle our own business and take care of uh, technologically that includes telephones, and our own security systems and, and whatnot, that comes under technology. 
We have roughly 375 students, although I would love to know how many incoming students I have to get a precise number on that. There's around 20 faculty, um, the information staff, that's library staff and folks helping out in all of this and keeping networks alive is about 15 of us, give or take. We have six classrooms, four buildings that we provide wireless service through and network services to. Um, the, the way it's set up there is I answer to the dean of the law school, and I'm responsible for, I'm the associate dean for information technology, which means I'm the library director. Um, we do have to keep the lights on, the network, and anything that's audiovisual, wherever those lines blur, uh, come under information services. In under information services, the way I break that down is technical services, public services, computing services. Technical services, most would be familiar with, technical services in a library. They may acquire some of the media that we use in audiovisual. Um, that is pretty much their role. Um, public services, not only are they answering reference questions and circulation questions, but they do help out in AV, and I'll explain that. Computing services primarily, although they help out with AV, uh, the telephones come under computing services, and keeping the network alive comes under um, computing services. Everything else is sort of blended, and AV is one of those blended things. Uh, if we talk about, we try to videotape. Anybody comes to campus or talks on campus, something happens, we want to capture that digitally, keep a record for it, not only for our pedagogical reasons, so we could use that in classes if we want, we can make the snippets uh, where we want in presentations, but also for history. We're a new law school, we want to build our history, these are some things that are going on. Um, it involves not only folks that can point a camera and make sure the microphones are on and things are working, but we work with the catalogers, going back to technical services to say, okay, we now have five hours of uh, debates between the mayor's wannabes of Orlando. We captured digitally. How do we break that out? How do we catalog it? How do we classify it? How do we uh, get that in the catalog so that we can find this history? And of course, technology staff are involved with creating the digital record, um, maintaining it, and getting it on the web so we have the links. Um, but AV is also, I mentioned four buildings in Florida, a lot of rain, a lot of bricks around campus. We have three cars that we push literally from building to building to building. Bum, bada, bum, bada, bum, bum. We have laptops. We have uh, PCs or laptops attached to them with um, projectors and all the equipment we need. Bum, bada, bum, bada, bum, bada, bum. Um, and sometimes in the rain, you see a reference librarian with an umbrella. Bum, bada, bum, bada, bum, bada, bum. And sometimes I have a circulation student bringing it back. And it is a back and forth thing. We keep them in the library. We used to keep them open, but then faculty members, uh, well, they felt free to take them, and then they wondered why they weren't there a week later when they never returned them and uh, parks went all over campus. Um, we also have people that an overhead is a frightening thing, and they want somebody there in the classroom because a light bulb may go out, you know, and, and so we have, you know, AV monitors, you know, that like just like junior high school that help the teacher and hold their hand and get them through some very basic audiovisual uh, materials. We have uh, more and more faculty are coming on and, and beginning to use more technology to really pushing the two people I have in uh, technical in computing services to the point where we can't keep up in the classroom any longer. We're using reference librarians. We're using circulation students for all the little stuff we can. But we have some faculty members that uh, if you introduce them, and when you introduce them to PowerPoint, they say, wow, this is cool. Let me play with it. I'll, I'll let you know if I've got some questions. And they go off, and, you know, they got a couple of questions, but all of a sudden they're using PowerPoint in the classroom. You have others that are saying, you know, no, not over my dead body. You know, you want me to do PowerPoint, here's my class, put it together for me, and I'll do it. Well, we don't have the staffing for that, and we've got more negotiations to go on. Um, web, uh, we also do the web is... Is it AV? Is it computing services? Is it reference? Is it circulation? Some people put it in the publication of the law school. Um, I like having to know what, uh, I like control over that content, knowing what's going on. We have got a uh, very new relationship, no, well, the relationship isn't new, with campus down in Miami Shores, but we have uh, a new way of working together on the web. 
And for example, they have five graphic artists and they have technology staff that I cannot imagine that are looking for some things to do. And they came to us and said, listen, let us help you with the website. Frankly, the website needs some help. And I said, well, you know, my thing is the content. I want to make sure I can put the information in and, and I got the intranet. And, and we actually came up with a plan where they, they're going to help us with our uh, a lot of input from us to design the shell for both the internet and the intranet and design the underlying database so that when we update something, I don't library hours on the intranet, it's automatically updated on the internet. Nobody's got to talk about it. Nobody's got to discuss it. Um, we just have access to it. They were willing to, you know, they came up and spent a couple of days with us. We went down uh, to Miami, spent some time with them, and came up with an agreement where they realized that, well, they, they really do want to make sure that the, the information is going up, that it is current, uh, that they don't have to wait on somebody else to promise it. Um, so we, uh, we have a nice alliance in that sense. They can help us out. Um, AV has always been the stepchild. Uh, it's law school deans, law faculty. They don't care who does it. They don't care if you're rolling a car down. Um, they don't care if it's projected in the ceiling. They'd like that. They realize that they go to other places and they see the projectors. Um, but it's don't spend any money on it, but this is what we need to do. And I think whether you call it in the library or you call it in IT or you call it AV department or educational uh, technologies, someone has got to get to the purse strings and say, listen, you need staffing for this. Um, now at Barry, I need staffing. I also need to put a few projectors in the ceiling. I need to get uh, some more wires in some more of the classrooms. Um, but it's easier for my, going back to my philosophical uh, point of view, it's easy for me to arm wrestle. I got a brand new dean coming in July. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, to arm wrestling him and saying, I don't care what you call it. You know, it, and some of my colleagues say, well, the library has been a black hole forever and, and I don't need another black hole like technology or I don't need another black hole like the web, let it go. But I go to my dean and say, listen, you call me a black hole anyway. I'll spend whatever you give me. This is what I want to spend it on. And it's still one arm wrestle. Uh, so that it still worked for me. Um, I'm going to turn it over, guys. Actually, I have, a, I have one question for you. How would you characterize your relationship with your with the Miami Shores Campus Central AV Group, or whatever would or whatever would pass for an AV Group and the okay. Miami Shores Campus? Actually, very good because we have used them in the past. We had a, a project where uh, one of the faculty members wanted to use a an interview as part of a first year legal writing class. And we wanted to digitize it. We don't have the equipment to digitize it. We had, we captured it. We had the video, and we looked all over different ways of doing it. Uh, contacted Barry and said, "Listen, can't you help us out? You've got the equipment." And it was, it was they were very happy to do it. The relationships are very good. One of the, the tricks, and this goes back to my, my philosophy of two years ago, IT belongs under the library, and I won't get into the centuries that libraries have been using technology and all. It's still on the web. You can look at what I said two years ago. But at Miami Shores, the director of the university library answers to the IT people. And it's just philosophically upside down. The director of IT down there and I understand this very different philosophy, um, yet manage to work very well together, uh, just understanding that it's different points of view that we have in the world. Um, the one thing I've noticed about um, as we're trying to define AV and multi-instructional technology is all the new names we're calling it. Um, we have called it uh, academic computing, classroom services, educational services, educational technology, instructional services, instructional technology, media services, and media technology, and maybe you know some more. Um, at Penn Law, we call it academic computing. Um, I, and it's uh, part of the IT department. Um, Penn Law IT reports directly to the dean and not to the library. I understand this might be the minority report, uh, although as Jean said earlier, uh, it's probably the silent majority. 
IT has always been a standalone department at Penn Law. It got its start in the late 1980s and reported to the assistant dean for finance. In the 1990s, it was still a standalone department, but it started reporting to the IT, I mean, excuse me, to the library director, and that changed in 2000. IT consists of four groups, a network systems, web and database, student and staff support, and academic computing. IT department includes 12 full-time and 10 part-time staff plus work studies. The academic computing group includes an instructional technology manager and an academic support manager, and they support 19 classrooms and seminar rooms, approximately 900 students, and 50 standing faculty and about 75 instructors. In the mid-1980s, AV services department was established in the law library after receiving a grant from the class of 1952 to provide funds for equipment. The services included delivering basic portable equipment, projectors, overheads, VCRs and TVs to the classrooms, and providing audio and videotaping of classes. The library also began and continues to develop the media collection of videotapes and DVDs. In 1996, the Center for Media Technology was established. This was a separate department from the library, and however, it also reported to the library director. The focus was to grow services, provide curriculum support, including a strong focus on video production. They continue to provide portable equipment to the classrooms. In 2001, the MTC Media Technology became a part of IT, and we renamed it Instructional Media Services, and that's part of the academic group. We, over the last couple of years, have done a major install of in-room technology in our classrooms. You know, that's a PC, LCD projectors, VCR, DVDs, cameras, audio systems, and we started a major push to support the curriculum with services such as the development and support of course management through a web course portal, providing IT training for course development, and new and improved access to instructional technologies. Our philosophy is basically that the IT department is there to support the educational and research mission of the Penn Law School through technology initiatives, services, resources, development, training, and support. Academic computing, and this is from my job description, is to provide leadership to the law school community in appropriate curricular and instructional and research use of medical media technologies. Typically, faculty are working on many things at the same time. They are doing research, writing papers for publication, handling administrative matters, teaching class, creating and providing course content, managing their course content, including multiple classroom handouts, communicating with students outside of class, both individually and in groups, through email, bulletin boards, blogs, and class email lists. They want to enable students who miss a class to not miss the information, and they want to give electronic and secure exams. IT offers a unified presence. We can consult with faculty to make sure that their technology and equipment fits their needs, that they're introduced to the appropriate level of programs and IT services, and we can help them integrate their information into various systems and faculty and students have to deal with, as well as providing ongoing training and support. Some of the services that we offer are classroom services. We research, design, implement, and maintain the instructional technologies, and basically we keep the trains running. We make sure that all the classrooms have dependable services, the faculty are comfortable with the technology in the rooms, the faculty aren't confronted with technology that they don't need, and we're advocates for the faculty as far as obtaining extra equipment that they might particularly need. We like to consider ourselves a custom shop. And we also always have a plan B in case something goes wrong. 
By Request Technologies, we bring in digital whiteboards, digital video recordings for web streaming, and additional microphones and wireless laptops in case it's a laptop class. Then we offer instructional services. We work with a faculty member on course development and instructional design support and provide IT training. And also we have a web course management system, which we call our web course portal. This allows faculty, this provides faculty with a framework that allows them to manage the course content the way they want, whether it be PowerPoint presentations, Word, Excel, WordPerfect, or PDF documents, audio, video, or other media files, as well as scanned handouts of articles that have been cut and pasted. It's web-based administration, so the faculty can prepare anywhere, and it's networked access so students can follow along in class if they wish. Content management modules of our portal include semester class schedules and course descriptions, course rosters, course announcements, classroom handouts and documents, multimedia access for audio recordings and video recordings, bulletin boards, class mailing list, digital bulk packs, and course evaluations, and access to old exams that the library provides. We also provide video conferencing services, streaming services, webcasting, and we developed a webcasting site so the library wants to also start providing. One of the things I think that we like to think of ourselves doing is providing sort of a framework for folks, other folks that, you know, it's like build it and you can come. We can make other people look good by making a wonderful framework for their content because we don't consider ourselves the content managers. And we have media services like video production, digital photography, digital editing, media dubbing, and event and moot court symposium services. And we have on campus a pen video production in case we need two camera shoots in a major sort of what we call high level production and consultation services. That's a four fee service. There's also on campus a classroom services which we have never used. That's for what they consider pool classrooms and the law school is separate from that. I'm going to jump in with a couple of questions here if I may. Kay, you touched on it but you didn't really go into any depth and I'm kind of interested. Why did the Central Media Technology Group move from the library to your organization or to the IT organization? Actually, most of the changes happened because people left. In our MTC director actually went on to the Penn campus and created the Penn Video Network. So he is actually doing, he has the consulting services that I can purchase if I need. And also IT, when we reported to the library, director retired. And so it became a standalone department rather than thinking of it again. It was my new dean at the time didn't feel that a continued report to the library made sense. So basically changes in personnel and administration and hierarchy resulted in a change in the organization. I have one other question for you. And it sounds like you offer like a huge smorgasbord of services with a huge number of staff. But what are you offering that's new since that move actually in 2001? That's mainly when we started all the installs into the classrooms, all the webcasting and the, I think, consultation with the faculty on their course. The nice thing about having it in IT is they have the full range of services. We can work with faculty from their research desktop while they make their editors have access to their document through a web and then develop it until it comes, they want to share it with their students in their class. It's just this wonderful from the beginning to the end because we have all the services. So many services now use technology. Research faculty in the library. You're right. I mean, there's 
there's so much going on, and, and, and a lot of it is technology. But I, I, <coughs> well, actually, interesting point. Where do the librarians come in in, in this? For example, in the instructional design um, piece of it, or in some of the research aspects of it, because um, we, we talked a lot about how as part of the IT organization there's an instructional designer and all of that, but, but there's definitely a role for the librarian oh, in there. And, and so do you bring them in into, into the consultation, or, or where, where are they as part of this role? Penn Law has a very strong partnership and collaboration environment, and um, the librarians um, work very closely with um, the faculty. They're, they're, uh, they're constantly uh, pro uh, providing research. Uh, for the faculty, for their courses, through the course portal. Mm. Uh, so we made a course portal that allows them to um, actually provide information. It's this framework so they can work with the faculty member, determine the kinds of things that they need, because it uh, and delivers multimedia uh, information. They can deliver it in any format. I know our librarians right now are working with one of our faculty members that use a lot of photographs. Mm. Uh, and, and we help them take the photographs off of maybe videotapes of a, an accident or whatever. And uh, then they provide this through um, the web course portal. And it's through the library's work on this. Great. How huge is your staff in all of IT? Uh, I have, uh, we call ourselves the Dirty Dozen, there's 12 of us, including me. Um, then I have about 10 part timers. Is that 12 FTE or 12 bodies and 10 of them are full time? Yeah. Well, full time. Twelve full time and ten part time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Describe a little bit about cross training within such a large group. Is everyone fungible or can you broken out to any person's niche? I'm sorry, would you? Is everyone cross training within those twelve or does everyone have a specific niche so a project will often get handed off from one individual to another as the um, a lot of folks, stand, we feel that we're kind of standing in the middle of the road. Um, there is a lot of handing off. We're very good at that. Um, we're a good team um, group. Um, so, uh, for example, the academic support manager who works with uh, the faculty in the offices to help them with their research and using uh, programs would hand off to the instructional technology manager when they get to the classroom. But it, they would cover for each other. Um, so they're definitely cross-trained. And also uh, the instructional technology manager would work with um, the departments and services as well because they're starting to provide a lot of things. And we're using the course portal in new ways. For example, they're doing things like um, our career planning and placement wants to ha you know, how to interview. Our library is uh, working on um, various um, tours. Um, and these are all now going to be provided through web access. You have your, your network administrator under your IT department, as well as all of your um, your web pages. Your, yes. Your webmaster is also under IT. Yes. And then as well as your educational technology. Yes. And multimedia. So you have sort of four things. Or how, how, would you, how would you visualize the various parts of the IT department? Um, I, I have broken it up into four different groups. I have what I consider my network and systems group. And that's the folks that take care of all the servers, all the desktops, uh, ports, um, although the backbone, uh, as far as the closet equipment, that's provided by campus. Um, then, um, and that's about 450 desktops throughout the building, and uh, we do all our own file and uh, sharing. We make, we do all our own uh, webmail, um, uh, email accounts for uh, all of uh, uh, our building. We don't use any campus services. Do your own email? Yes, we do our own email, uh, and, and we offer webmail um, and, and IMAP. Um, and then uh, I have a web and database group, and those folks are the ones who develop the course portal, and they um, do all the programming, and they help people with scripts and putting up um, forms. If someone wanted to do a quick, uh, how many people are coming to, you know, here's a sign up. They work with uh, real close um, with the um, uh, folks on that. We also have a support group, which we call the staff um, and student support. We, that includes our help desk, and um, those folks are liaisons. They go out, they train the departments, 
And that's like a lot of the administrative work, like the student record system and the finance systems. But they also need some web forms and things like that and ways to share documents internally. We have an intranet site called the GOAT because that's a law school mascot. And you have to come to the building to understand. And the intranet folks can provide things to just students or just to their own department. And then I have the academic computing group, and that's the instructional technology manager and the support manager. Things like moot court and trial practice and evidence take up a lot of energy and a lot of time. How do you apportion that work out? Was part of the video video support, video production, you know, miking, where they have a moot court practice, that kind of stuff? We do. We record, like, when they're practicing. For moot court, we do the complete recording. And sometimes it's held in a place where we actually have to take our cameras out of the building and we have to use other facilities because it's such a large group that comes. But for your basic everyday sort of classroom instruction, we're mostly theory. We don't do a lot of practice moot courts. But the ones that are done in the clinical programs, they're recorded. We have a special room that has cameras to follow the folks around, you know, as they speak. We like to, you know, teach folks to fish instead of just giving them fish. So lots of our – we have our assistant director for library services. He's also a lecturer. He teaches oral history. And we taught him how to use a camera. As a matter of fact, we got a special for him. In prior years, I used to send out a photographer and lighting equipment to go with him to interview people for oral history. Now he takes the camera. He teaches – well, with our support, he teaches the students how to use the cameras, and they get an end product. So by empowering our users, we get a lot more mileage. Yeah, we use students a lot for moot court and trial ad. And the faculty members, too, are willing – when they come in, they say, well, I want every one of my students to be taped so that they can take a look at it. Even they realize that, and you can't possibly do all this, so what can I do to help? And you turn around, well, look, I can set up a camera. I can show you how to use it and tell your student to stand here. And then you got it, and they can work with that and train some students to help out, too. And then the final product, we would make sure that we want to capture historically, and then we would go in and capture it. Is the final product put on the web so it could be archived or accessed by a password-protected group? That's exactly right. They all go on the intranet, and some of them go on the internet. And that's why we want to capture it and capture them all digitally. And catalog them and classify them so we can find them five years from now and ten years from now and 20 years from now. Yes. We have time for yet one more question. Is there somebody that writes a documentation about the hierarchy and the description of what everyone does and the documentation of the different procedures and stuff? Is that something that you may have done? And if it is, is it something that you can take a look at on the web? No, it wouldn't be on the web. But I do have an operations manager that takes care of all the purchasing and things like that. And I have – and I do most of the policies. I mean, all of my groups would write policies, and I would work with them. We are very light on documentation. I mean, we like to do, like, the steps of how to set up things, and we like to point to the folks who have written wonderful documentation. And because we don't want to entrench ourselves. We always want to do the very next thing. We don't want to get so entrenched in one technology or one version of anything. And by, you know, spending a lot of time writing a lot of documentation, I don't mean not the user support, just how to get into it, but most of the programs today come with a lot of tutorial programs that are built right in. So we don't want to recreate that. With that, I'm going to turn it back, actually, over to Terry. Okay. Is this on? Yeah. I'm going to get up because, frankly, I'm tired. Thank you. 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 Thank
tired of sitting. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Terry McCormick. I am the audiovisual librarian and head of the Corrin Center at the University at Buffalo Law Library. I am a librarian and I uh, went into media services through the library school. And one of the things that informed the creation of our department was the fact that at Buffalo, they had from 1980 on through the mid-90s, a very aggressive media services program within the MLS program. And what that did was it inculcated a lot of media studies, a lot of media work um, into graduating librarians. And a lot of librarians who went out in the field became media specialists in school systems or are occupying positions similar to mine. The Corrin Center at the University of Buffalo is part of the law library, as I said. We are a non-autonomous law library, which means we are not part of the law school. We are part of university libraries. I answer to the dean, or, or I'm sorry, I answer to the director, our director, Jim Millis. He is the only person in the law library that is a member of the law faculty. All of the rest of us are, are members of the university libraries. We're members of the university libraries faculty. In order to keep our jobs, we have to win tenure. Um, and most of us have done that. But it, there's a whole different governance that we're part of. And that dictates how our money flows for our acquisitions budget, how it flows for our equipment, how you can move people and change things around in the library. So, I mean, that's very important. Now, my department is a full-service audiovisual department. We handle production, as these people have mentioned. We handle equipment distribution. We still distribute equipment manually for the most part, not in every, not in every case, but for the most part, because it's a 1970s building, Gene's presentation yesterday, and a lot of the facility had been built without um, AV in mind or any sort of instructional services in mind at all. So a lot of the stuff we'll push in, we'll carry down, we'll physically carry it down, um, and those sorts of things. We are at work right now retrofitting the building. I am working with our IT person in the law school, and we go back and forth on getting funding through the dean of the law school to retrofit. I mean, we have cooperation. I, handed, I gave out a handout that sort of lists our um, areas of cooperation, and law IT is uh, an important one for us. Going back to this again, as a librarian, and well, let me tell you about how the, the department was created. The department was actually created because of law faculty demand for audiovisual services. The law faculty at UB is traditionally a non-black letter law faculty. There's a lot of social science, there's a lot of hard science and things like that being introduced into the coursework. I run a full film rental program. We purchase a lot of videos. We purchase, we've started renting videos for the next term and some of those will purchase. Some faculty want us to rent them during the course and we've had to FedEx videos in. My students, my students uh, take the equipment down, they set it up. We, we pretty much will deliver service within 24 hours, eight hours, four hours, and 10 minutes on faculty demand. And the reason for that is because I have a full-time assistant working under me in the department and we hire 10 to 12 student assistants a year, um, per semester rather. And I have at least two student assistants on at all times, especially when the equipment distribution becomes heavy. Um, in addition to our audiovisual responsibilities, I'm also responsible for the microform collection. The microform collection at our library at UB is about 48% of the entire volume count of that library. Um, we buy Russ Bassett cabinets like they're going out of style. <laughs> we fill them up. 
like they're going out of style. I mean, our intake in fish alone is about 60,000 pieces a year. When my students aren't pushing equipment around, when they're not scheduling setups for me, they're ta doing, taking care of the micrographics material. A lot of our summer hours are spent taking care of that collection. During the course of the year, we're doing the audiovisual work. How did, that's an interesting marriage. How did, how did microforms get in? Historically in libraries, <laughs> microform was shoved in the audiovisual departments because the you put them into a rear screen projector. And none of the traditional librarians wanted to work with it. So that's a historic characteristic. And that marriage is still there. And it's, it's just something that's come down. It's not unusual to find. To what? <laughs> that will probably never happen for preservation reasons. And there's all sorts of debates in AALL over this very topic. I mean, DVD, um, optical media, they just don't have the, uh, the uh, longevity that micrographics do. In fact, right now as we speak, I shouldn't be getting off on this, but he struck an emotional chord with me. You have 30 seconds. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kodak is going around to insurance companies, to banks, reconverting their electronic files back to microform. The reason is, is they want to make this stuff last in perpetuity, and they're afraid that there's going to be digital deterioration within the next 10 to 15 years. They, they're building machines called comp processors. It's computers to microfilm. And if any of you are going to AAL next month, we're going to have a program on that, so be there. <laughs> um, going back to the audiovisual part of this, we start scheduling for the next semester in the middle of the previous one. We set up tons of equipment, or we do a lot of setups every year. Um, and it hasn't, it hasn't been that much of a problem. And I don't want to go into the, all the details of what it is I do, because I wrote all that out for you to take off and with you to, to look at and study. One of the most important services that I didn't put down there was more of the information theory part of my job and why it's relevant to how it's married to librarianship. Um, I never force technology down a faculty member's throat. I don't think it's going to work. Generally, a faculty member comes to me with a problem, an issue. How can I make this work in my class? Can you provide us with a technology that does this? And sometimes it is PowerPoint. Sometimes it's just a simple videotape that we find for them. But the most important thing and the thing that well, at least the circle I move in, is concerned with is giving people the wrong technology to use where it becomes noise in the communication system, where it actually detracts from the pedagogy of the class. And I think to some degree, you know, we're, we force things like PowerPoint down people's throats. And you'll notice I'm not using it now because I don't think it's appropriate for this. And I tell faculty that. Now, I'll give you one short story, if I may. When projectors started coming out, probably mid-90s, they had a very, very low ANSI rating. And you could barely see the image on the screen unless you shut down all the lights in the room. There was one junior faculty member that was hired. And at that time, there was a push by the dean to use technology in the classroom. So she felt she had to use PowerPoint in the classroom. Now, it was a large room. It had a greater throw distance than this room did. So I set the projector up for her. You could barely see it unless you shut down all the lights. And you couldn't do that because the students couldn't write. So I kept going to her and I said, you know, this is not working. You're going to have to step back because we can print color transparencies for you. I know it's not high tech. I know you can't use a laptop, but your students won't go blind. And you'll be able to teach using the transparencies. And that's the point. 
That's what you always have to look at, and that's how I sort of the philosophy of my uh, my department is when we're uh, when we're using technology with uh, faculty. So that's it. There you have it. Actually, I, I do have one question. Are you physically located? In the law school? That's well. Let me tell you that the architecture of O'Brien, and we have asbestos too, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> My department is on the fifth floor of O'Brien Hall, inside the library, and the library building is part of the law school. The faculty are in and out of my office and my department all the time. It's nothing to have them come in the back room, sit down and use our production equipment. We have one faculty member that likes to do nonlinear editing all the time. He just walks in, sits down and uses it. He comes over and bangs on my door when he gets in trouble with it. I go over and help him. I should add to this too. We do intensive training of our students. The, if you look at my handout, most of the students I hire are at the graduate level. The majority are law students. The other graduates range from library science to electrical engineering. And at the beginning of the semester, we train them on all the operation of most of the heavily used equipment. The better students, I take them out and I, I show them complex equipment. We triage our operation. My full-time technical assistant looks at the pattern of the setups. If we have a big special event, we schedule people according to that. And it works out well. It's, it's a lot of work, but it works out well. And we'll probably continue doing that until we retrofit some of the rooms to something similar like this, um, money permitting. But, you know, our governor is George Pataki, and the New York State Legislature isn't forthcoming with money during these times either. Okay, thank you. Yes. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with uh, copyright problems. <coughs> this was to copy a commercial film. Uh, yeah, I flat out tell them they can't do it. We try to obtain a, a license if we can for something, um, but then they want to borrow it and they may want to use it over and over and over. and. The license says you can have it for 30 days, and they want a backup copy. And um, it, it annoys me over the years how many head-to-heads I've had to have with faculty members that, you know, it's like, damn it, we're a law school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and what lesson do you want to give? But it, 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 too often do we have to have that fight. I concur with that. They don't ask me anymore because they know what the response exactly. is going to be. Okay. The other thing I do, and I didn't mention, I mentioned... Um, special events that we do. I make sure the, the group sponsoring the event sends out to all the speakers copyright release forms. Right. We keep a file of that. Anything I do copy, I demand written permission. My assistant has a copyright release file, copyright permissions file. That, those are the only circumstances that I'll copy anything. People email um, my assistant and me things all the time, and we just put it straight on the schedule. Um, I can bring mine up. Oh, okay, actually. Well, keep the conversation going. I'll bring um, it up. I can, I, yeah, I, was gonna say. I can answer. Um, we have a one um, front door, we call it. It's our help desk. And folks can email to the help desk. They can walk in, telephone, yeah, and online form. The help desk will then route the call um, or the um, request to the appropriate folks. There's what we call a track it database by Blue Ocean that we use. And, um, and so we use that. Uh, and so indeed, if people weren't around and it was an emergency, uh, they would track down someone else to take care of it because everyone logs in and, and sees the calls. But mainly the help desk's responsibility is to uh, make sure that call is filled. We have a web reservation form, a telephone number, and an email, and it all goes basic to the exact same place. And it, you know, the instant something comes in, um, we send a, a response saying yes, we received it. It's now logged into the master schedule, and we have a master schedule. Yeah, that's that's what we've got. Yeah. Three different ways of coming at us. 
at Arkansas, I know we sent an email out, and that would, the email would go to six different people so it didn't get lost. Uh, yeah, my question is, um, do any of you, now I'm at the University of Toledo, I am the only, until two weeks ago when we filled an open position, I was the only professional staff member in the law school whose job description explicitly included responsibility for audiovisual. Um, the other thing that goes on at the University of Toledo, uh, our support staff is unionized. Mm -hmm. And so there are some, uh, uh, the circulation associate is uh, a member of the union and her contracting, uh, her union contract includes uh, certain responsibilities under audiovisual. Now, do and, and I have no control over that person with respect to the audiovisual. I just have to work with her as best I can. Uh, do any of you on the panel work with unionized support staff for provision of audiovisual services? And if you do, uh, you know how do you try to? minimize the potential for difficulty and then handle problems when, when they do come up. Well, I'm from New York, and everybody's in the union. <laughs> <laughs> um, the faculty are in a union. The librarians are in the same union. The support staff are in the same union. Um, our, our, no, well, our support staff are in a different union. And the only people, except for the graduate assistants, are the students who aren't in a union. We don't have, I've never run across a problem with this. I mean, a, a, lot, of, a lot of union activity in general is fighting with the governor. The, the, you'll, you will have issues related to job descriptions come up, but I've never had it come up in, in the context I work in. Uh, some of the central groups I deal with at the University of Minnesota actually are unionized, mainly in the construction areas. Um, I don't, since I'm actually quote unquote buying their services, I usually don't have an issue. That my largest issue with them are their work hours or lack thereof. Um, but that's, I mean, this is something um, you know that I have to that you just kind of deal with or whatever. But uh, you know, otherwise, at least within the overall organization, um, the reporting lines are fairly clear so everyone knows what they need to do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When a room is, is uh, signed for or requested like that, um, do you guys, do any of you handle room reservations? I mean, it's in the physical space and then uh, how does it hand it off to the case technology and the person who plans on using it? Do you address that? Well, until recently, we did have a lot to do with the actual room reservations. We just built a system that handed it over to the registrar or somebody in the registrar's office um, but so that we don't do any after hours or, or uh, any other scheduling for rooms. Um, but part of that system is that we're notified that we need this equipment in that room at that time. I control some space where my department's responsible for scheduling the rooms. There are trial technique rooms, and we use them for other things, too, like um, telephone conferencing and things like that. For our electronic rooms in the library and the one in the law school, or, for, or the one that we have partially electronic with a PA system, I go through the academic schedule for the year before the class starts. And if somebody is in a room that uses a lot of AV technology, I go to records and registration and have them switch that faculty member to a room that's more acceptable to um, the services I provide. If, if they can do it because of the space size. And I've done that. I actually have done that right before I left for Cali. Uh, we, have, um, we have a similar. Uh, we work with the registrar's office at the beginning of every semester to um, as to help fit the right professor's class into the right rooms. Uh, for events, that is a problem for us. Events are scheduled by the registrar's office and by a couple other folks. Um, and they go into an EMS system, which we um, uh, have on the server for them. 
but they don't um, make sure that we know if the, the event that they've scheduled requires media. And uh, we need to revisit this. This is something we're working on because many events will get a last minute notice that they need a lot of support. And sometimes they've, they've actually rented the room to external um, folks to come in and they expect full media services to, to have come with the rental of the room. So uh, that's a, a problem for us. We basically have an identical situation at the University of Minnesota, except the law school controls, controls its own rooms and buildings. And so the person who actually manages the facility um, always knows to ask, do you need media services? And whenever I get a media services request, I always say, did you reserve the room? And so we, there's still you know, there's still a couple of hiccups here and there, because sometimes the, the end user um, just doesn't read the note that the, the facilities person sent back or that I sent back saying, did you, know, did, you, did you do a room reservation or did you contact you know, media service or you know, educational technology media services? And, and so that does happen. We get some last minute requests. Usually we can accommodate um, if it's after hours and I normally don't have someone scheduled and it's someone off campus, they are out of luck. Um, I mean, that's, this, that's their lack of planning, lack of reading our notices that are all over the place and the lack of our following up with them and they're not responding. So if it's someone um, in the law school, I will come, you know, I'll come in and, and fill it last minute if there's no one else, if I can't get any of my staff last minute to do it. Um, and if it's someone at the university, it's if the, they can go, always go to central media services and so I usually refer them back to them. But that doesn't happen very often. I think it's happened once in the last year. I've actually had to cover for something that was really last minute that, that slipped through. Because usually with 24 hour notice I can get Someone scheduled, or we can. I can do anything. So. Yeah, the biggest problem I have is, is outside groups. I mean, like student groups. I mean, uh, yeah. the classes we've got those covered. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if a if a, a professor isn't scheduled appropriately, but I was just concerned how you you handle the, the student groups, or sometimes we're finding that people because our facility is better than some of the other on campus, right. they'll come yeah. in <laughs> and they want to use it. Oh, I thought my microphone and projector was included. Yeah. Um, I guess one more question, and, and then um, the panel is over. Oh, I was curious about, for example, within each of your organizations, so a math and or a new LCD panel, or, or in your case, a new Dell or a new smart board. How do you, do you have separate AD budgets, or is it all sort of sloshy mm -hmm. funds? Well, what, one of my arguments to, to deans is that one reason that I believe it belongs in one place is what? One arm wrestle a year. You know, I'm going to come at you, and you know my job is to get as much as I can, and your job is to give me as little as you can, and everybody wants to slice of the pie. But I'll do it one time. Um, and in different places, I, I mean, I've had to convince deans of it, but I, I won't go to a place unless I do convince them. Uh, they, they realize the benefit of that, because otherwise I've got people dipping in whenever they want, or, you know, where is technology? Is that, is that library technology or is that classroom technology? Or is that, oh, maybe that's the clinic technology or maybe that's a telephone. Is, do I charge the clinic for that telephone? And I'm sitting there going, it doesn't make sense. Let, let me worry about, you know, the, the technology requirements or the computing requirements or who needs a new computer or who needs a new telephone. If I don't do a good job, you have ways of getting my attention. You know, if I fail, if, if I'm buying my friends the new computers and, you know, I mean, you have you have a way of doing it. But meanwhile, it's still one arm wrestle instead of somebody else trying to figure out, well, how much, you know, telephones in the clinic and how much is it. So. In my case, very quickly, I'll go to the director of the library and we'll determine if we have to do a roundabout to the dean. But I also have, for my department, this M. Robert Corrin title I have in my title. That's a source of development money. And there's a development fund for my department dedicated to audiovisual equipment and things like that. And I empty it out once in a while, and we have to replenish it. But I probably have, you know, there's three directions I usually go for money. It's the law school, it's my director, and it's that fund. And sometimes we manage to get money out of central university libraries if it's a cooperative project. Um, so that that's a fourth one. Uh, 
My budgeting is just, it's the IT budget. And I take all the, any big initiatives, for example, the classroom installs as a separate special project for a year and get it funded separately. But it's most of the other kinds of things that we do are just part of the other things that we're doing as far as supporting desktops. I have just one comment. Jean, as a student at your school, when I was there, I had your job. And we take William Rehnquist's speech on the last Open Real VHS, or not VHS. Oh my gosh. Sorry, Open Real VHS. That's the history. Do you still have it? Actually, it doesn't exist there anymore. No, we retired it. Okay. We were doing VHS by the time I left. Okay. That would probably do. Thank you very much. Good job.